Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into the biggest news, making headlines across the region and around the world, speaking with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On today's show, as world leaders, policymakers and senior business figures converge in Davos for the first in-person meeting in more than two years, we speak with the World Economic Forum's President, Borge Brende, to ask whether the meeting can find a solution to climate change, the food crisis or war in Ukraine, and how to turn the talk into real action. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, the World Economic Forum is taking place in person for the first time in more than two years. Now, this year's meeting is focusing on working together, restoring trust. But with a worldwide pandemic, a disastrous war in Ukraine and ongoing economic and environmental crises. Frankly speaking, is there still any point of the meeting taking place in Davos? Well, thank you. And uh, I think uh, the meeting uh, could not have been more timely. Uh, global challenges, as you lay out, needs uh, global solutions. But unfortunately, because of the polarized world, we don't see as much collaboration uh, to really solve uh, wars, uh, climate change, and also a weakening recovery. But we will try in Davos. Uh, to get leaders together and at least uh, mobilize the private sector uh, to support uh, in these very critical areas. But there's many who say Davos has become broadly irrelevant, more of a show. Politicians sticking to a pre-prepared script, fancy pavilions, fondue nights and sponsored parties until early in the morning. Frankly speaking, is the forum's problem purely image related or has the forum lost its soul? I think we will uh, see in Davos that uh, we will make progress on uh, many of uh, the most important topics. We will, for example, have new coalitions uh, when it comes to fighting climate change. We'll also see that uh, the Ukrainian uh, leaders uh, will gather there. We will have President uh, Zelensky on video, but we'll also have several ministers and CEOs are coming together and they are forming a group of CEOs uh, for Ukraine to also secure the rebuilding of the country. We'll also focus a lot on uh, trade and investments. We know that there will be no real economic recovery without a trade recovery. So that's why it's so important that uh, we also have trade ministers, 30 of them, together with uh, Dr. Ngozi, the head of WTO, saying that no new tariffs, uh, no more pro uh, protectionism, and no more bans on exporting food. So many of the challenges that we are faced with cannot be solved without business. And uh, with the 1,400 CEOs and chairs in Davos, I'm pretty sure we're gonna make a progress. And 25% of the participants are women. Uh, it should have been 50, but we are making progress. A quarter just isn't good enough these days. So, so are you facing WEF is having a, an image problem? The Financial Times this week said it doesn't uh, portray the right image. Do you disagree with that? I think we uh, definitely are able to bring uh, together leaders from all walks of life. It's uh, easy to be critical, but I think uh, also the past has shown that the World Economic Forum has positive impact. Uh, it is in Davos, for example, where the Global Alliance for Vaccines were launched, uh, Gavi and the Global Fund. It was where, where also Nelson Mandela uh, came uh, to Europe for the first time and launched uh, the economic plan uh, for South Africa. And this time, it is really about how to make sure that the weak recovery don't end in a new recession. It is making sure that we walk the talk from COP26 in Glasgow. Business leaders, 120 of them will commit to going net zero by uh, 2050. So this is really the place where um, corporates and governmental leaders are coming together making a difference. Well, certainly some big goals there to fix. With so many different disasters taking place in the world right now, how do you decide what gets the most attention? What is the top priority at this year's meeting? So um, 
it is true that uh, there uh, has not been a meeting in Davos taking place against such a complicated geopolitical and geoeconomic backdrop for decades. So I think that comes also with a big responsibility. It's uh, going to be a very serious uh, meeting. So we will have like NATO Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg and Ursula von der Leyen laying out the land also for more security in uh, Europe. We will have uh, 20 senators and Congress uh, representatives um, from uh, the US also uh, trying to see how can we end the polarization in the US politics and for the middle, from the Middle East, we have a lot of leaders coming and we know that uh, the Middle East is still incredibly important as um, it comes to energy for the world. And it's all about decoupling, but it's also about energy security because with the soaring energy prices we are seeing currently, we will uh, also see uh, really bad effects on the global recovery that is so weak. Well, I noticed that one topic you didn't touch on a lot there was the crisis in Ukraine. Now, I know that Ukrainian President Zelensky is giving a speech at this year's meeting. He'll be joining via Zoom. However, I also note that unlike the case has been in previous years, the Russians have not been invited to take part. Now, I've interviewed the forum's founder, Klaus Schwab, several times, and he's always been very proud about his impartiality and his reputation as a bridge builder. But how can you build any bridges or encourage debate if you're not inviting both sides of a conflict? It is true that we are sending a strong signal uh, by inviting President Zelensky from Kiev. We will have two of his deputy, uh, deputy prime ministers. We also uh, have the foreign minister uh, in uh, Davos. When it comes to Russia, we chose not to invite Russian business this year and not uh, Russian officials because um, there are limits, you know, Russia has broken basic humanitarian law, international law. They're not sticking to the UN Charter and they've seen so many uh, atrocities. The key for unlocking this and change this is with Mr. Putin and Kremlin. And we need to see that they're stake, taking steps to again uh, rejoin uh, compliance with international law before uh, they will be reinvited to Davos. We, we do have a strong moral um, obligation uh, to also send this kind of signal uh, in such a situation. And it's true, Russia must be held accountable for the atrocities that have been committed in Ukraine. However, violations um, have certainly not stopped the forum from inviting countries like Iran or Israel. So, frankly speaking, it feels like there's a bit of a double standard to invite those countries, but not invite Russia. It is true that uh, over the more than 50 years, the World Economic Forum has uh, really tried to bring leaders uh, together. But there are limits. It's an ongoing war in Ukraine where we see that uh, children are being killed in their schools every day. We see women being raped. We see like really war crimes taking place. And there is no willingness for dialogue. Davos is about willingness to find common solutions. And if countries at least are willing to sit down and discuss the future, then it is something else. But uh, today, we see no kind of this willingness from Russia's side. That's why we're very sad that we can uh, not have this dialogue, hopefully in the future, but not today. But we know there are plenty of atrocities taking place from Israel to Palestine. We know plenty of children, plenty of women as well as men have lost their lives in this conflict. It feels like one rule applies to Russia and one to Israel. Is that because that Ukraine is seen as closer to home for many Europeans? Uh, it, it is uh, unacceptable uh, what is now happening in Ukraine and the war is ongoing. When it comes to uh, Israel and the situation uh, in uh, the Palestinian areas, it is uh, at least some willingness to dialogue. We've seen it through uh, the Abrahams Accord, but we also see in Davos that we are bringing together uh, business leaders from both Israel and the Palestinian side in an initiative called the Breaking the Impasse. And they're sitting there with global politicians, but also politicians from these areas to discuss, is there a way forward 
for establishing a two-state solution between the Palestinians and the Israelis. So I don't think this is uh, totally comparable. At least there are a dialogue going on and we hope uh, for future solutions. Okay, well, final question on Russia. Of course, you are a former foreign minister to, uh, to Norway and you have some incredible expertise and insights into the world of international politics. In your view, how do you see this conflict finishing? Do you think the sanctions on Russia are enough and is an expanded NATO the solution? So um, I think uh, Russia uh, is uh, incredibly surprised by the strength of the Ukrainian army. They were supposed to take Kiev, the capital, in two, three days, uh, Kharkiv, uh, the second largest cities, in two, three days. And they have seen the resistance uh, among uh, the Ukrainians that I have, uh, I'm sure, has surprised them, and that's why they're pulling back too. I think, unfortunately, they will continue um, with hitting the Ukrainians uh, in the months uh, to come. But, uh, you know, Ukraine can easily turn into the Vietnam of uh, Russia or Afghanistan of Russia, because when more than 40 million people are fighting back so strongly as the freedom-seeking Ukrainians, Russians uh, will have a huge challenge. It shows that even a very modern and a very strong army cannot kill the freedom-fighting people around the world. So I think this is a lesson for many countries uh, to bring with them and reflect over. Well, let's turn now to the Middle East and North Africa. Now, forum officials have recently made many visits to Saudi Arabia. I know back in January 2020, you announced a regional summit for the MENA region will take place in Saudi that year. Now, of course, that didn't end up happening due to COVID. But is a regional WEF summit in Riyadh still on the table? Will it happen in 2023? No, we, we are very much looking forward to coming back to uh, Riyadh. So far, we have not been able to take up any of our regional meetings because of the unpredictability related to the pandemic. We were supposed to have our summer Davos physically uh, in China. That might have to be hybrid or maybe only digital. But when uh, times are getting back to normal, when it comes to uh, the pandemic, we're very much looking forward to going also back to the Middle East. So are you saying that the WEF Forum has a new regional home in the Middle East, in Saudi? Because traditionally, you know, we've seen a lot of meetings take place in the Middle East, but typically it's often been places uh, like Sham El Sheikh or along the Dead Sea. Yes, uh, it's true that we, we have been in Jordan, we have been uh, to uh, Egypt. I think it's about time also that we go to uh, the kingdom. So we are very much looking forward to have uh, meetings there. If we resume uh, the regional meetings as we had them in the past, that's uh, to be seen. But um, we really uh, also appreciate the strong delegation we have uh, from Saudi Arabia in Davos. We have seven key ministers, including the foreign minister, the finance ministers uh, with us uh, in uh, Davos. But we also have very strong delegations from uh, the other GCC countries. That shows uh, that uh, um, the GCC countries are also very focused on um, trade uh, investments, but also doing their uh, fair share of building uh, global stability. You've been a regular visitor yourself to the kingdom. You've met the leadership and Saudi is undergoing sweeping reforms. What in your view has been the most outstanding change that you've noticed during your visits? I know previously you've been impressed with the electronic visas and the increasing role of women in power. What else do you see as being some of the most momentous changes? I'm very glad you mentioned uh, women, uh, you know, compared to when I visited the kingdom, first time decades ago, uh, the situation for women now in Saudi Arabia is very different. Uh, you see them driving, when you come to hotels or restaurants, uh, you see women being a natural part uh, of uh, society. And uh, we know that uh, also at the universities, more than 60% of the students are women. This is uh, very important. And uh, I think this shows uh, the new leadership. Uh, I think the whole investment uh, in uh, diversifying the economy, but also in the new technologies and in education and skills is very important. Um, Saudi Arabia needs to produce higher up in the value chain uh, in the years uh, to come. 
where also you inject more technology into the production. And that's why I'm also very happy that we did open our center for the fourth industrial revolution, the World Economic Forum Center in Riyadh uh, just a year ago. And I was there and I'm seeing uh, so much progress when it comes to also uh, technologies. You previously said there is a challenge of perceptions with regard to rapid economic change in the region. You said that in the Middle East, you're faced with two kind of realities at the same time. It's one of the youngest populations in the world, and there's a lot of innovation underway, entrepreneurship and startups. But at the same time, there's a lot of conflicts and proxy wars going on in the region. So what role do you see Saudi Arabia playing in all of that? So I do see no uh, willingness to be very serious in uh, investing uh, the additional resources and revenues coming uh, from the energy sector uh, in uh, diversifying the economy and also building a very solid sovereign wealth fund. As you mentioned, I have been in Norwegian politics for decades and Norway built a sovereign wealth fund that is no, uh, just the yield from the sovereign wealth fund is the largest uh, uh, income uh, in the Norwegian uh, state budget and our is being invested uh, in education, but also better conditions for Norwegian industries. And I think this is what Saudi Arabia is now replicating. And this will uh, also give a very solid fundament for the years to come, when of course, uh, oil and gas revenues also will peak. Of course, that will take a, a long time, but those money should be invested in diversification, education, skills, infrastructure and also in the green transition that we will see happening in Saudi Arabia. For example, the huge investments now uh, in renewables and solar is unparalleled um, in the kingdom. Um, what kind of future projects do you see the World Economic Forum being involved with the kingdom as well? We mentioned obviously launching the fourth industrial revolution project as well, but what other future opportunities do you see? So we um, also have um, initiatives related to accelerating uh, gender equality. I think that should be uh, one of the next steps. We also have a skills accelerator where we have a playbook on how to also reskill, upskill uh, people that are currently not uh, in the educational system. We also have work on uh, in enhancing competitiveness for a country. And I think uh, there are areas still where Saudi Arabia can improve. I'm thinking about the tax system, uh, red tape, uh, and I know that the finance minister is very serious on this. And that collaboration is something that we would like even to take further. You also hold an annual summit on global agendas taking place in the UAE. It typically happens about November each year. Is that still taking place this year? And how does it fit into the World Economic Forum's map of events? So uh, you're very well informed. I'm, I'm so glad we have those uh, global future councils, um, 40 or 50 of them that look into the crystal ball and uh, give a recommendation and advice. And they usually meet in November physically uh, in Dubai. I think this year it still will be uh, difficult because of the pandemic, but we're definitely resuming this and we're definitely back uh, in November 2023. At least that is our plan for now. Now, Davos opens this week. You say it's more vital than ever to be holding this meeting. And in some ways, I think it's easy to forget that the pandemic is still raging on. A third of the world remains unvaccinated. Do you think some of the big issues that are happening today overshadows the fact that we have a pandemic? And how do we prepare for the next one? I think it's very important what you just mentioned, prepare for the next one, because um, we will see uh, new uh, diseases and uh, pandemics, unfortunately, in the coming decades too. Uh, we move much closer uh, to nature. You know, uh, just the 10 last years, we lost wilderness in the world of the size of uh, the country of Mexico. So animals and uh, human beings are much closer and then we will also see more diseases uh, like this. And we should not forget that we're not out of the woods yet. Look at the second largest economy in the world, China. It's partly locked down now in some of the biggest and largest uh, cities in the country. And this will also have impact uh, on the global economy because uh, China is 
uh, growing slower and uh, the demand from uh, China will of course go down and we will for the future have to learn from this pandemic that we have to have medicine, we have to have medical equipments much closer than before. We can't wait for weeks uh, for this to arrive. We have also have to be able to step up vaccination uh, fast and uh, we know that we have paid a huge price. 15 million people lost their lives so far in this pandemic. What kind of initiatives is the World Economic Forum currently working on to either prevent or manage the next pandemic? Bill Gates has come out recently. He says it's going to take a billion dollars each year to prevent the next pandemic. He's calling for a global mobilisation of forces to deal with it. What are your thoughts? Is that the kind of thing that the World Economic Forum would support? Indeed. And I, I think there will be a need for more than a, a billion US dollars. We have to... Um, really, really address the blind spots that we are still um, facing. I think that um, what we saw on the vaccine side was a uh, big learning. Um, you know, it took less than a year uh, to develop um, effective vaccines. In the past, we have seen uh, this taking a decade and the whole mRNA uh, technology uh, is something that we have to build on. In Davos uh, in 2017, uh, we launched this SEP initiative. This is an organization that is built for scaling up very, very fast uh, new vaccines if you see new diseases or pandemics coming. Here we have to invest much more. And what we have learned is that COVID anywhere is COVID everywhere. But we don't act accordingly. When one third of the global population is not vaccinated yet, um, if they uh, will then see new waves of COVID, also uh, new variants can be brewing in these countries and then it can hit back. So we really need to um, think globally and act uh, regionally and locally, but we will need to also support the developing countries that are really, really badly hit. And for the first time in three decades this year, we will see extreme poverty growing again. It has been reduced every year. We've gone from 40% of people living in extreme poverty three decades ago to 10% now. And now it's on the rise due to the aftermath of this um, terrible pandemic. Well, so many big issues that the world is dealing with right now. We've spoken uh, about the pandemic, about Ukraine as well, but there's also many countries on the brink of a recession, rising inflation we're dealing with, the food crisis as well. What do you think is the biggest global crisis we're facing today? Very short term, I think the weakening recession is of uh, great concern because uh, we invested 14 trillion US dollars. We haven't seen this stimulus since the Second World War to fight uh, the um, uh, consequences of uh, COVID when it came to the global economy. Many countries are now indebted. And if we see a slowing of uh, the recovery before it really started, there is very little ammunition to fight a new recession. So that's why we have to get it right. Of course, we have to take inflation seriously. In many countries, we have inflation we haven't seen in 40 years, for example, no in the United Kingdom and the US. So the interest has to go up. But we also have to make sure that we don't lose the baby with the bathwater, because if we uh, don't continue some of the investments that also can create growth, we are really, really in a very bad situation. And then uh, with less growth and potentially a recession, we will see uh, jobs being lost, we'll see increased unemployment and less prosperity. And the world needs economic growth to address uh, uh, poverty eradication. We also need economic growth to also face and avoid a new uh, food crisis. And of course, uh, the energy prices and energy access is critical here because without access to competitive energy, there will be no real recovery. So we're really in the most complicated economic situation, I think now for decades. No easy solutions there either. We wish you the best of luck in Davos this week. Borge Brenda, President of the World Economic Forum, thank you very much for speaking with us on Frankly Speaking. Thank you.